Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast, which helps entrepreneurs generate more impact, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a smart connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. This podcast is sponsored by Virtual Non-Execs, the world's number one peer-to-peer board advisor community, which connects thousands of investors, entrepreneurs and advisors globally. Hello, and welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. Today, I am truly honored to host author and consultant Anne Latham from New Hampshire, which is in the Boston area in the US. Welcome, Anne. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Jane. It's great to be here. Yeah. So Anne is also known as the Queen of Clarity, which is a very exciting topic. She's written three fantastic books on this topic, The Disconnect Principle, The Power of Clarity and The Clarity Papers, as well as hundreds of articles for publications such as the New York Times, Bloomberg and Management Today. And she's also an expert blogger for Forbes.com. And I'm incredibly excited to share her wisdom and insights with you. So here's the issue that Anne's obsessed with and that we're going to talk about today. Organizations, both large and small, are more stressed than ever before. And innovation and global competition has created relentless pressure and teams and their managers are really struggling to perform. And customers have never had higher expectations. As much as 80% of working time is lost to unnecessary meetings, misleading or poor communications and other wasteful delays. 80%, that's a kind of huge impact in terms of productivity. So Anne's book, The Power of Clarity, exposes these saboteurs of success and explains how to eliminate them. And her book, The Disconnect Principle, examines the way that we traditionally think about feedback, accountability, and performance management, which stops us from being the kind of human beings that we really want to be. So we're going to be looking at those topics, depending on where you're watching and listening. So yeah, let's get right into it, Anne, if that's okay with you. Sounds good to me. But before we do, we just want to hear a little bit about you. So how did you get to be so passionate about this topic of clarity, connection, the impact that communications has on organizations and people? Yeah, okay. So I had a corporate career and at some point I decided I wanted to go out and be an independent consultant because I wanted to have a broader impact. I wanted to help more organizations instead of just helping my boss, you know? So, Mm -hmm. but before I quit my job, I asked bunches of my, the people I'd worked with, bosses, former bosses, coworkers. I said, what is it that I do extremely well that is most unusual? And the responses I got, they were wonderful. They were thoughtful. They were great. But they basically all pointed to that I create clarity. And they say, you know, you take in massive quantities of information. You cut to the chase. You find the important kernel. You get everyone on the same page and you move things forward. So I decided to call my business Uncommon Clarity. And I, it was fun because I'd get out there, you know, new business owner, networking with people and people would introduce me. And I was sure when they said that, you know, her business is uncommon clarity, that just gibberish would come out of my mouth after that. (laughs) After a couple of months, I had people introducing me and saying, this is Ann Latham. She, her company's called Uncommon Clarity and she really is uncommonly clear, which, you know, was wonderful. Just wonderful to hear. So From there, I realized that that really is my value. That's what I do Mm -hmm. best. And so my whole goal was to bring, teach people how to create that clarity. But the problem is that people don't buy clarity. They don't know that they aren't as clear as they think they are. There's no urgency there. What people want are more effective teams or strategic planning or uh, process improvements. And so I did a lot of consulting doing those things. But on the side, I'm writing articles about how to create clarity, how you can be clear, 
how you can be more productive, how you can be more confident through clarity and empower other people you work with. And so that has been my passion all along, and it led to my writing my books. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes that's a really interesting point because I work with a lot of consultants and sometimes they'll come to me and they'll say, well, you know, really what's at the heart of this is mindset, for example. And it's like, I know that mindset is really important. We know that clarity is important because we've all had experience of poor communications and people running off in different directions and doing all the wrong things because of that. But sometimes people, they don't want to look at that in the first instance, do they? They want to look at things like, well, how can we make our teams be more efficient? How can we get better results from them? It's all the surface level thing. But of course, what's underneath it is that thing of, are you really communicating in the right way? Yes. Yeah. This That lack of clarity. And then Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about clarity, we talk about clarity as if it's this little point in the sky and we're always just a little bit off. You know, if we could just be a little clear, if it's a little less confusing, if we were just a little more precise, then we'd all be on the same page. But in my book, The Power of Clarity, I talk about the whole first chapter is called We Aren't As Clear As We Think We Are, and it's costly. And I give example after example of where we just aren't clear. Yes. All. And I introduce the idea of a spectrum instead of this point in the sky. Mm-hmm. And clarity goes from, I coined the term disclarity, which is a complete lack of clarity because I get mm-hmm. tired of typing lack of clarity. So disclarity on one hand and uncommon clarity on the other hand. And I chose uncommon clarity because since people think they are clearer than they are, they would put themselves too far up that spectrum. But if you say uncommon clarity, very few people would say, oh yeah, I'm uncommonly clear, (laughs) you know? So it makes you think about, well, where, how clear really are we? And how do we know? Where do, where does things, where do things stand on that spectrum? So that we quit thinking, oh, we're just a little bit unclear because we aren't, we're really unclear. Yeah. And I think that's such an important point because we make all sorts of assumptions and we tell ourselves stories about ourselves, don't we? And I like to think that I'm a relatively clear communicator. I think I have a gift of communication. But I think when I get unclear, it is usually because my thinking is unclear. It's not because of what comes out of my mouth. So doesn't it always start with clarity of thought? Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons people struggle, because when they hear I care about clarity, they think it's just about communication. And to me, that's the tip of the iceberg. Yes. It's the way we interact. It's the way we think. It's the way, it's everything we do. Yeah. So that's why we end up with thinking, well, you know, if I just say the right words, somehow magically everything's going to be clear. Yeah. So I can give you a, a great example that I don't know if you'll identify with, but I remember being a new employee years ago in a high tech company where everyone was speaking in acronyms and I was too new to understand the acronyms. So I'm sitting in this meeting and I'm trying so hard to understand what they're talking about. And there are probably eight people in the meeting and and two guys start going back and forth trying to solve a problem. So they're going back and forth and finally they finish and they've resolved the problem, right? And I'm sitting there going, I'm not sure what they're talking about, but I said, "I, I can't, I have to interrupt. I said, did you just agree to do blah, blah, blah? (laughs) <laughs> one guy said yes and the other guy said no simultaneously really and they didn't have a clue that they weren't even sort of arriving at the same conclusion furthermore there were five or six other people in the room who did understand those acronyms who never noticed that these guys weren't even sort of in agreement even though they went back and forth and thought they were in complete agreement wow that's really powerful it's so thought-provoking i just love this topic So all these people are in organizations thinking that they're giving clear instructions and that people are not delivering on those instructions and everybody's getting frustrated and everybody feels underappreciated or not heard. It's all to do with this issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it totally is. And I know you care a lot about building teams and how important it is to have strong teams. And I tell another story in the beginning of The Power of Clarity about a woman who was new to the company and her boss called her into the room and said, you know, we need you to 
look into whether we should put branded sun cream dispensers in the park, because this was a, a, a big medical conglomerate, you know, with hospitals and, and clinics and everything else. And so people will be happy to have the sun cream there. If they forgot, they'll see our name, they'll be happy for us. And so would you look into this, please? So this new employee who wanted to impress goes back and engages her whole team, which is three or four people, to, and they looked into, you know, what had been done in the past, what kinds of regulations would they have to deal with, how would they get these things installed, had anyone, you know, had have other companies, medical companies done it, how would they maintain these things? I mean, and so she put together this real thorough recommendation about whether this was a good idea and how they would proceed. She brings it to her boss three weeks later. So her team of three or four people spent a good part of three weeks working on this. The boss looks at her, rolls her eyeballs and said, all I wanted was a gut reaction, yes or no, because that other VP thought this was a great idea and I thought it was stupid. Oh, really? The whole, all their work went in the trash. Talk about trashing a team. So now this whole team just, lost all that time. They've lost confidence in their boss. Yeah. Their new, you know, their new manager. The manager has lost confidence in her vice president. And furthermore, the vice president hires me to come in and coach this new employee to see if I can improve her judgment. Oh, and, and then presumably you found out the truth that it wasn't her fault, but it was how she'd been Look into, with. Yeah. look into this, couldn't be more vague, you know? So, so look at how she destroyed her own team. This, she destroyed the team with this new manager. She's destroyed all these relationships and she wasted all this time because she said, look into this. And all she wanted was a gut reaction so she could tell this other vice president it was a dumb idea. But she didn't t- say that. But and the sad thing is that when they hired me, no one realized what had happened. And no one even saw that it was such a vague request. And it is true that a lot of organizations are very, very wasteful, aren't they? Obviously, I'm an entrepreneur and I move in entrepreneurial circles. And people, they tend to be a lot more careful in some respects about this, about the way that they perhaps communicate with others simply because the consequences are always felt very fast. Whereas in organizations, do you think it's partly because people are getting paid, going to get paid their paycheck at the end of the month, regardless of those infringements, let's just say, in terms of the communications? I don't know if it's because they're just going to, they're going to get paid anyway. But I mean, when you look at corporations that are, you know, they any place that they produce anything, especially factories, and they're, they, they want 99% uptime, right? They want those factories pumping things out without interruption, without delays. They want everything to be perfect. They want, and as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, customers expect perfect quality these days. Mm-hmm. So that's the expectation is that everything's going to be smooth, fast, perfect. And on the factory floor, that's true. It does work that way. And it's not just on the factory floor. It's also if you're, you know, whatever your production processes are, if you're a bank and you're processing loan applications, those processes are the clearest and the best in the whole company. Everyone knows what the purpose is, what the purpose process is, what the priorities are, what the roles and responsibilities are. And our production processes get things done fast and well. Mm -hmm. I talk about in the power of clarity is that when you move away from those production processes that are moving physical objects and you move into the realm of knowledge workers and managers where you are moving cognitive objects, your job is not to move physical things around. Your job is to move ideas and decisions and plans and in problem resolutions. And we've never been taught really how to do that. We don't have the same kind of tools that the assembly line has. You know, we don't have the same kind of clear priorities. There's so much less clarity there. It's just sad. So while we expect perfection on the factory floor, we just tolerate the fact that 80% of our efforts are going out the window among cognitive workers because yeah, things without a point. 
And we, like you say, we have miscommunication and that sends people off on wild goose chases, like look into this. Yeah, I, I think it's such an important point and I know exactly what you're saying. And of course, when we're talking about humans, I mean, humans aren't robots. We're, we're not yet anyway. We are quite contrary creatures. We have good days and bad days and we have uh, people we like and dislike and we have agendas and feelings and all of these kind of things, which actually makes it a lot more complex and therefore a much bigger issue, right? Right. But think about the fact that decisions, decisions are the most important thing we do all day long. We make thousands of decisions every day. We make, there was a study that said we made like, you know, thousands of food related decisions every day. <laughs> yeah. Not to mention just the, you know, the decisions that are the fork in the road, for, forks in the road all day long. And yet, if you ask 10 people to tell you what their process is for making decisions, you would get more than 10 answers as they try to figure out how to answer that question. So there's, we don't even think in terms of a standard process when we think in terms of decision making. Whereas you would never, you know, build up parts on the assembly line without a well-defined process. Mm -hmm. You know, there's very simple processes for making decisions. And there's no reason why we can't all go about that in the same way so that we're working on the same step at the same time focusing our intelligence and getting things done. But no, we get in the room and talk and hope a decision pops out at the other end. We do. And I think that's because a lot of us, we like the sound of our own voices. There's no sweeter word to us than I, right? Because we love significance, don't we? We love to be noticed. And obviously talking about stuff gets us noticed. But in a way, I guess what I'm kind of getting from talking to you is that this is like nobody has actually shone a torch into these kind of very obvious areas when you're talking about them, you know, processes for decision making, actually stopping that self-indulgent, just all that stuff that goes on in meetings. And we all know it goes on. I mean, I've spent 20 years working in organizations as well. And, you know, sitting around just having these meetings where people are just talking for the sake of it and everybody else is expected to listen. Yeah, We've all been there. And that discipline, that if a discipline is kind of brought in to actually make those meetings structured and to follow a process, I can only imagine how much more effective and happier probably people would be. Because nobody like, likes to be on the receiving end of somebody kind of just talking in a completely sort of fuzzy, unclear and self-indulgent way, do right. they? Yeah. Well, and it's funny because, you know, meetings have been in this hot topic that they get universally hated for decades and decades, despite the fact that mm -hmm. there are a bazillion articles out there on how to improve meetings. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the, probably the 80s, even, or 90s, when people said, well, the problem is you have to have an agenda. So people started saying, okay, I'm not going to the meeting unless there's an agenda. Well, the problem is that those agendas are this piece of paper that usually describe how you should waste your time. And they are filled with what I call treadmill verbs. So words like review, report, communicate, share. These are words you've seen on agendas, right? Yeah. And when you think about it, you can review forever. There's no way to know when you're done. You can report forever. It's like being on a treadmill. You can communicate forever. There's no way to know when you're done. So if you want to move something forward in a meeting, you can't use treadmill verbs on your agenda. You have uh -huh. to use what I call destination verbs. And the good news is that there's really only about six of them. <laughs> oh, really? So one is decide. Like we oh. are, decisions are a fork in the road. So if you need to decide something, it's easy to know when you're done because you've decided it and you've made progress and you've unleashed next steps. Mm. You can resolve a problem. That's number two. If you've solved the problem, you're done. You, you're, you can move on, right? You've unleashed next steps. The third is plan. Now, you got to be a little careful here because I know people who can plan forever, but 
if you create the plan, you know when you're done because you've got your plan and you unleash next steps and you move ahead. Those are the kinds of words that should be on your agenda. There's a couple more. Yeah. One is a list. And that might seem silly, but you don't always make the entire decision. You might list the decision criteria, or you might list your alternatives, or you might list the risks. Each time you create one of those relevant lists, which is an input to your decision process, you have moved things forwards. You have accomplished something. You've unleashed next steps. So lists, the right kinds of lists that are inputs to plans, decisions, and problem resolutions move things forward. If you're talking about planning, a list could be important lists are things like lists of resources, lists of action items, lists of risks again. So these things, you you have to accomplish something each step of the way in your meeting towards these goals. The fifth one is confirm. You confirm something. It's This is when you walk into a meeting and you say, you know, I've done this and now I'm going to do this. Am I on the right track? We do this all the time. And the problem is that's a yes or no question. <laughs> but do people say yes or no? No, they start telling you their war stories and they start giving you advice and they tell you that, oh, by the way, when you get to step 10, be sure to do this. And the person's not even listening because they're on step two. All they wanted was a yes or a no. The sixth destination or yeah, sixth destination verb is approve. It's like confirm. Okay, we've got our plan. We're ready to roll. Do we have approval? Do we have the authority to do this? Again, it's a yes or no answer. If the answer is yes, you've unleashed next steps. If the answer is no, you take it offline and figure out what's missing. But those are the only six words that should be on your agenda. Those yes. destinations, you know when you're done. There's two others I would consider, and that one is questions and answers. So you can, you know, what questions do you have? Here's the questions. Here's the answers. You know when you're done, when you've asked your questions, and when you've gotten your answers. But that's it. There's yeah. Reporting, reviewing, sharing, communicating, updating. Forget all that stuff. What decisions do we need? What plan do we need? What list of risks do we need? What information do we need? What approval do we need? Let's move forward. Yeah, oh, that makes so much sense. And I, you know, I while you were talking, I was just remembering that I used to. We did a big piece of work for a television company called ITB here in the UK. And the boss of ITB, he used to insist on having all of his meetings standing up, and he would never allocate more than fifteen minutes because. For all of these reasons, that well, what do you think about that? And do you think that's uh, brutal, or do you think that's efficient? Well, I think it's stupid because <laughs> if you're clear about what decision do we need, what next step do you know needs to be planned. If you're clear mm -hmm. about what outcome you need, that drives the meeting. And there's no reason to make people stand up and be in pain. I don't know about you, but I think better when I'm comfortable. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, putting me under the gun and standing me up if I <laughs> suspect something isn't going to help me make a better decision. Yeah. Problem is that meetings go on and on because they're not clear about what they're trying to accomplish. Yes. You never start a meeting unless you know what needs to be different when you are done. So what do we need to walk out of here that we don't have coming in? What decision do we need? What plan do we need? What list do we need? And if you can't be clear about that, you shouldn't be calling a meeting. Yeah, I, you know, I've got one other, you know, big question, really. And because I have a team, you know, I work in teams a lot, but obviously I have an online business, so I work remotely a lot of the time. And some of I've, what I've noticed is that some of the older people that I work with who are more used to let's just say face-to-face -face communications. We don't come from a you know that era where basically everything was kind of electronic. So I've noticed that the older people, they like to kind of at least have a video call and they like to meet face-to-face -face if they can. 
Whereas the younger people that I work with, particularly the more tech orientated people, it's really hard to actually get them into a conversation. They just want to communicate electronically all the time and through text and WhatsApp and Messenger and all the rest of it. And the last thing they want to do is actually have a conversation. Now, is that good or is that bad? Well, you know, the, the rules I'm talking about, the use of eliminating the treadmill verbs and being precise about your destination each time, what needs to be different when we're done, that applies to email, it applies to text. Don't mm-hmm. send me an email that doesn't tell me what needs to be different when we're done. Yes. What is this email going to accomplish? Be very specific about it. And guess what? It's probably a decision, a plan, a problem, resolution, confirmation, approval, or a list. You know, so those things move things forward. If you have a clear decision process, and there's a a really simple process, and it's four steps, and if everyone understands those four steps and they know we're on step one, step two next, step three, and you keep focused, there's no reason why you can't make decisions electronically. You just nail step one first, which is what decision are we making? Step two, what are the decision criteria? How will we know that good decision when we see it? You know, a good alternative. How will we tell if what the objectives we're trying to accomplish. So that's step two. Step three, what are our options? What are the alternatives? And step four, what are the risks associated with what looks like the best alternative? So you can do that very simply by email or meeting or text or anything. Every case, it's not going to work well unless you're focused on, look, we're on step one. What decision are we making? <laughs> you know, or we're on step three. What are the alternatives? Here's the three alternatives I've come up with. What would you add to that list? So it will speed up your results and keep everyone focused and channeling all that brain power onto the same thing. If you bring process clarity to the picture and you're specific about what needs to be different when you're done. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think obviously, you know, standard operating procedures, all these kind of apps that are out there, you know, the project management apps I use, I mean, a number of different ones, but Trello, for example, you know, we've everything can be organized online, but I think it does make it more efficient in terms of, uh, you know, making lists and checking them off and all the rest of it and making, introducing some clarity. But I always feel that what is lost is sometimes just that kind of human sparking off one another that is just to do with like real, the enjoyment and the pleasure really of actually, you know, just having a conversation in person. Yeah. And I wonder what you thought about that. Well, I totally agree with that. I I mean, as much as whether you're doing email, text or whatever, that Clarity and that process clarity is so important that, you know, that specificity of what you're trying to accomplish is so important, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that things couldn't be better face-to-face. I much prefer face-to-face, you know, you get me in a room with a group of people and I will get them from A to B in virtually unanimous agreement, even if they start out, you know, button heads, because I can work with them in that room as a group and and move them forward because I can see what they're thinking. I can see where their pain is, mm-hmm. where their frustration is, and I can move them along. Put me on a Zoom session where half of them have their video off mm-hmm. and I just want to hang up. Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot harder, I think. And sometimes I, you know, I talk to my children and you know, they have a so I'm having an argument with my boyfriend or whatever. And I was like, well, what kind of an argument are you having? You know, you're just like on the phone all the time. Yeah, I'm arguing with him on WhatsApp or something like that. And it's like, look, that's not even a proper argument because everybody, you know, electronic communications can be interpreted in different ways. And if you're going to have a proper argument or if you're going to, you know, try and resolve something, you've got to speak face to face. And I think there seems to be this kind of idea, really, that somehow because everybody uses electronic communications, that it can that it can be a substitute for real human interaction. And it really can't because we are emotional creatures, aren't we? And we do have a very deep need, don't we, to actually 
you know, spark off one another and and gauge one another's emotions and react to emotion, don't we? Yes. And it, and also, we need all the clues we can get to create clarity because mm. we don't know where people stand. And that's it's actually is a perfect lead in for my second, my other book, The Disconnect Principle. Because yes. The whole point of the disconnect principle is that well, all of us have our expectations dashed repeatedly, right? You know, you're you're waiting for something, it didn't happen. You expected something, it didn't happen. And what we tend to do is assume pretty quickly that someone else screwed up. And as soon as we think, okay, the other person screwed up, now you're in a position where you need to give them that bad news that they screwed up and you need to change them. You need to help them. You need to fix them. And so now a simple unmet expe- expectation turns into a difficult conversation mm. right? because you're upset with the other person. You're going you're gonna to straighten them out. You're going to tell them what they did wrong. And the truth is when someone doesn't meet your expectations, all you know for certain is that someone didn't meet your expectations. You don't know what happened. You don't know why it happened. You know, you know, there's you can brainstorm a multitude of reasons why someone didn't do exactly what you expected. Many of them might be your fault. True. But the whole disconnect principle is when something doesn't happen the way you expected, all you know is that something didn't happen the way you expected. And the best response, whether you're talking to your boyfriend or talking to your employee, or talking to a coworker, is, whoa, I think we have a disconnect. And when you say that, and you you just say, look, I was expecting this, it didn't happen, I think we have a disconnect, you are providing this sort of level playing field, It's there's no blame, there's just this open, you know, something didn't work out right, where are we, what's next? And it treats the other person with respect. It treats them as a partner to figure out where are we and what's next. And there is no need to have difficult conversations. You eliminate the difficult conversations by taking that blame out of the equation. Yeah, and that is that's fascinating because just being neutral around, okay, I recognize that there is a disconnect here that somehow something that I'm say, saying is not being received in the way that I wanted it to be received or vice versa. It, it's a very loving kind of approach in a way compared to what our instinct is, which is to immediately go on the defensive and start blaming, which a lot of people do. They'll judge, they'll blame, they'll you know find reasons outside of themselves or alternatively, they will turn it in and start to blame and judge themselves. And I love this idea of just making it neutral and just recognizing and being alert to the idea that, look, we didn't, on this particular occasion, we didn't see eye to eye about something and exploring why that is. Yeah, exactly. You just say, I think we have a disconnect. And then, you know, it's respectful. It's kind. You don't get emotionally upset about it. They don't get defensive. You're fixed. You want to fix the situation. You don't want to fix the other person. None of us want to be fixed. None of us want to be controlled, coerced, manipulated in any way. You know, we just, wait a minute. I'm a reasonable human being. I didn't do what you expected because I didn't hear you. I thought there was something more important. I had other priorities. I thought someone else was going to do. I mean, you know, there any number of things can happen that prevent your expectations from being met perfectly. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing that I was thinking though is that obviously it's great when people are genuinely willing to approach, let's say, a breakdown in communication from a non-judgmental and open-minded perspective. But of course, as we all know, there are plenty of people in the world who they get a payoff from their, you know, bad behavior and there are, you know, bullies and sociopaths and, you know, people who we really would not want to have in our lives working in organizations and sometimes in positions of power over us. 
So what do we do when we have this, you know, this idea? We've been trained to talk about, look, I think we've got to disconnect. And then somebody starts, well, what do you mean a disconnect? Oh, I said this. <laughs> How do, but, you know, the, the first chapter of the disconnect principle just lays out the disconnect principle and the, the idea that you should respond with, I think we have a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I had this revelation of what this, the, about the disconnect principle working with a client after I taught him everything he needed to know about how to give feedback and everything you've all read, you know, and uh, then he went in to do it and he failed miserably. He came out miserable. The employee was defensive and it was all because in his mind, he was still judging this guy. He was thinking that, you know, this, he had to fix this guy. He was going to have to read him the riot act. So he went in there with a perfect script and yet he, you know, his body language, his facial expression, his impromptu words, all of that gave him away. And so anyway, that's what inspired the disconnect principle. But then as I started teaching this to clients, issues like the one you just brought up came up. And I also discovered that there's all kinds of things that are standard management behaviors that are obstacles to using the disconnect principle effectively. So that's what chapters two, three, four, five, six, and seven are about. And the one, the question you just asked is what I call the ultimate disconnect. Oh. So the most important disconnect or the connection that you need to make as a, especially as an employer is to be sure there's a good match between what a person is willing and able to provide and what the organization needs. So instead of you being the boss who says, you know, you failed, you're a bad employee, I'm going to fire you. You need to shift your thinking to this disconnect principle mindset and say, look, this is what the organization needs. What are you willing and able to provide? And by the way, one of the things the organization needs is that you don't act like a bully, that you don't treat people this way, you know, and, and that what you just did, this is why it belittled someone and why it's not okay. You know, if, if you can't fit in here in a collaborative, helpful way, then we have the ultimate disconnect, and that is that you're not able to willing and able to provide what we need, and we can try to you know massage that. But ultimately, if you have a nice objective conversation about this, your employees should realize that they need to leave before you have to tell them that they need to leave. But recognizing that ultimate disconnect is really important and allows you to say you know it's just not a good fit. It's not that you failed. It's not that it's your fault. It's just not a good fit. Yeah, I'm not a good fit. As you said, no judgment there. But I think what's really interesting about what you were talking about is also this issue of kind of to toxic workplace culture. And, yeah. you know, I've seen this a few times recently because my daughters are of the age where they are, you know, in the workplace at the moment. And I've seen them and their friends, you, you know, I've seen examples of fantastic companies to work for that are the envy of everybody because they're just so, you know, so kind of flexible and so supportive and really wonderful. And at the other end of the scale, I've seen, without naming any names, I've seen examples of this real, you know, toxic kind of overly high expectation and demands and really a horrible, difficult kind of culture to survive in. And it really does come from the top, doesn't it? It's, it's yeah. You can't change a culture, a toxic culture that is being led by a tyrant into a warm, fuzzy place through working with middle management and teams because right. it's always going to be that way, isn't it? And because it's led from the top. Yeah, because if, if you've got people who believe in controlling coercing, manipulating, disciplining, and fixing the person instead of fixing the match or fixing the situation, you're yes. not going to have that mutual respect. You're not right. going to have collaborative problem solving. It's mm -hmm. going to be horrible. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. So, and it, it is horrible. Yeah. So and, yeah. And what happens is the good people leave and they're left with the sheep or the people who are you know, they're hiding because they probably wouldn't survive in a more empowered and interesting organization. And that's just a race to the bottom, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I like to believe there's a place for everybody if people are focused on the match, you know. Yeah. 
everyone's got something to deliver, to bring to the party. And if you find the right match, most people can be of value to organizations. Well, I guess so. I mean, I suppose that there will be organizations where basically everybody's a snake. <laughs> and that is the match. Yeah. No, I'm saying, yeah, those organizations, like you say, they're, they're, the toxicity is at the top. You know, there's nothing you can do about it and just leave yeah. those, let them die. But the, the nice thing about the disconnect principle that I've written about is that it's ideally everyone in the organization reads the book, understands it, and changes the way beha they behave. Yeah, but yeah. The thing about it is that if, if, if something goes wrong between us and we just say, look, I think we've got a disconnect, it takes all that tension away and makes it possible to solve problems. It doesn't matter if the person has read the book too or if the boss is a jerk. It's just like, whoa, you're right. L where are we? What are the next steps? That's all that matters. It's not about what you did wrong. It's not about blame. It's not about someone failing. It's just, okay, something didn't work there. Where are we? What's the next step? Yeah, and I think, you know, very much the same principle can be applied to uh, client relationships or customer relationships as well. Yeah. You know, and I often think, I oft obviously, I work with clients who are consultants and service-based business owners. So those are the mostly the types of people that I help. And so obviously they are all dealing with kind of fairly high value clients. And if somebody is not right for you, and I always say this to them, then it is just, it is this issue of fit and that we are all for somebody and we are all not for somebody in service-based businesses. And it is really our dialogue and interface with the market that is training us in terms of who we are for and who we're not for. And it's a, almost a natural evolutionary process. So it makes a lot of sense to me that whether it's teams or whether it's the interface with the clients and the customers and actually, you know, what you're doing out there in the marketplace, the same principles apply, don't they? Absolutely. And it applies, it will apply to your children and your boyfriend and, you know, yeah. his brother because... It's yes. very simple. It's like, step back, admit you don't know really what's going on, what happened. Just my expectations weren't met. Poor little me. You know? <laughs> no, yeah. where are we? What do we have to do next? Yeah, I, I just love that because it's very simple, but at the same time, quite profound. So I would imagine that once you read the book, you've got the radar and you just start to look at things in a different way and you start to recognize Okay, now we've got a disconnect. Yes, yes. And what do we do about it? Okay, well, that that sounds amazing. So, Anne, you know, you have written so much on this topic, and you really are a, a worldwide authority on this. So, I would definitely recommend that anybody who is in an organization who wants to, you know, get better teams, better outcomes, better productivity, efficiency, or whatever, that they read your books. So let's just go through them again. And what are the names? Have you got them there? Or... Okay. So the power of clarity. Yeah. Unleash the true potential of workplace productivity, confidence, and empowerment. Amazing. This book, it really is about mindset shifts like you were just talking about. A yeah. Lot is quite simple. It's not always easy to apply, but it's simple in that when you see things differently, you go, oh, wow, we need to do it that way, you know? Yeah. The Disconnect Principle is my most recent book, and this is the one that's eliminate difficult conversations with clarity and empathy. Don't practice how you're going to handle those difficult conversations. Eliminate them with the Disconnect Principle. And the Third book is The Clarity Papers. That's my the earliest one. And that is a more detailed approach to the power of clarity. It gives you more specific tools and techniques that aren't in the other book. So I hope everyone will go out and read them all because they will make the world a clearer place where things work more effectively and people can be their best selves and accomplish what they really want to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, there also could be very useful manifestos for consultants, coaches, and people who are actually advising organizations as well as the team leaders within them. So 
Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing all your wisdom and insight with us today. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. So tell me, if our viewers and listeners want to speak to you or reach out to you in person, what's the best channel for them to do that on? AnneLatham.com. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Anne. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, look forward to releasing the podcast and to practicing the power of clarity in my own business and life. So thank you so much. Been great to have you here. Great. Thank you very much. And I didn't share all the tips. There's a lot left in those books. <laughs> yeah. So so make sure you buy them. Definitely. Great okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Jane Baylor is the Smart Connector, a London-based, passionate serial entrepreneur, brand marketer and business growth exploder who helps overlooked and undervalued consultants and sector experts generate consistent, scalable revenues through becoming the go-to choice of their dream clients. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate you liking, rating and reviewing the podcast on the platform you've heard it on. And check out the links in the show notes if you'd like to connect with Jane or any of her guests in person. Thank you for listening and come back soon.